Former President Trump in the courtroom this morning to face his first criminal trial, plus the New York residents who may decide his fate. NTD's legal correspondent explains what we can expect during the jury selection process. Israel is weighing its response after fending off a significant Iranian attack. The situation on the ground remains tense. The FBI boards the ship that hit and collapsed the Francis Scott Key Bridge last month. Investigators are looking to see if any federal laws were broken. More Chinese citizens are entering the U.S. illegally. We have the latest numbers regarding the ongoing crisis. And a lawsuit filed by a conservative college student organization is challenging whether the group's First Amendment rights are being violated. We'll talk to the legal team that's filing the case. Welcome to NTD Newsroom, I'm Stephanie Cox. The first of former President Trump's criminal trials is beginning in New York. Before entering the courtroom, Trump said he's fighting for the freedom of Americans. Prosecutors are accusing him of falsifying business records related to an alleged affair with adult actress Stephanie Clifford, also known as Stormy Daniels. Soon after Trump arrived at the courthouse, he talked to the media briefly. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. There's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. And it's a country that's failing. It's a country that's run by an incompetent man who's very much involved in this case. This is really an attack on a political opponent. That's all it is. So I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. What should we expect from the jury selection today? And TD's Arlene Richards breaks down what to look for. Today is the first day of jury selection, so there will not be any witnesses called and the attorneys will not be giving opening statements. However, the judge will likely address some outstanding requests, such as the defense motion for Judge Mershon to recuse himself. Now, this is the second motion asking him to step down. Mershon denied the previous motion. The defense has argued that the judge is biased because his daughter has worked for a company that supported the 2020 Biden campaign, as well as several other Democrats. Judge Mershon has said his daughter is not involved in this trial, so there is no conflict. I expect him to deny the motion again today. The defense on Friday filed a letter objecting to the jury selection process. Jurors have to answer a 42-question questionnaire and read their answers out loud. Afterwards, attorneys can ask follow-up questions, and based on that, attorneys can excuse jurors. Now, the judge is not requiring jurors to state whether or not they like Trump on the questionnaire. The defense says not putting that question on the questionnaire is problematic, because if someone doesn't like Trump, he should be automatically disqualified. And by not putting that question on there, Trump is deprived of a fair trial. They also argue that the questionnaire benefits the prosecution because it identifies people who affiliate with Trump's political party. And the prosecution can immediately excuse those jurors. So what should the attorneys be looking for in a juror? Everybody in Manhattan has an opinion about Trump, and the majority, according to a survey, think he is already guilty. The defense will use that to strike as many jurors as they can but they will be looking for people who are sympathetic to Trump's situation. According to the New York Times, that would be younger black men and working class men, such as policemen and firemen and construction workers. Also, legal experts say Trump's team should be looking for jurors with a strong moral compass. 
those who can put aside their bias and analyze the case as instructed by the judge, applying the law to the facts and making a determination based on the evidence provided and the law of whether the prosecution proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution, on the other hand, will be looking for jurors who can accept that their star witness, Michael Cohen, is a convicted liar. I think that is their biggest challenge. They will want to eliminate jurors who have a problem listening to Cohen and keep those who can accept his testimony as is. This process could take up to two weeks before the attorneys are satisfied that they have 12 fair and impartial jurors. And today, prosecutors have requested that Judge Mershon fine Donald Trump $3,000 for social media posts that allegedly violated a gag order. This order prohibits him from discussing witnesses involved in his case. For more on this case, tune in to our evening news at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 Pacific. The next Trump Media and Technology Group's stock plummeted 15% today after the company announced a massive offering of new shares. The company went public last month. The stock value had rocketed leading up to that initial public offering, but has since lost more than 60% of its value from its peak on March 26th. A new stock offering now could help the struggling company stay afloat, but there's a catch. This new offering of 21.5 million shares would decrease the value of current shares. Trump himself has lost billions since the company went public. An investigation by another federal agency into the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore is underway. The FBI is looking into whether the ship, named Dolly, was in violation of federal safety laws when it left port on the morning of the accident. The ship hit one of the bridge's supporting columns, causing it to collapse into the Patasco River during the early morning hours of March 26th. The deadly crash killed six bridge workers. Divers have recovered three of the six bodies. While details of the FBI probe aren't being released, the Washington Post reports that agents will specifically look at whether the crew of the Dolly knew the ship's system were, was failing before they left port. The FBI investigation comes a week after the National Transportation Safety Board conducted its investigation. NTSB Chair Jennifer Homendy says their investigators were focusing on the ship's electrical power system. The ship experienced power issues moments before the crash. And Israel fought off an aerial attack from Iran over the weekend, signaling a major escalation of tensions in the Middle East. Iran launched over 300 projectiles on Saturday in its first direct attack on Israel from Iranian territory. Israel stated that it, along with its allies, shut down 99 percent of the projectiles. This included cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and drone attacks. A few caused light damage to a military base in the south of the country. We've been ex exercising with the U.S. Central Command this type of scenario for many years now. Uh, I think what proved um, that the exercises that have been committed up until now was that we were very well prepared. A 99% interception rate is a s exceptional um, success. Iran said the attack was in response to what it claims was an Israeli strike on its embassy compound in Syria earlier this month. Israel's foreign minister said he wouldn't rule out retaliating against Iran, but President Biden is pushing for a diplomatic solution to prevent further escalation. Israel reopened its airspace early yesterday morning and lifted orders for its citizens to take shelter. NTD News, Virginia Gibson. And now Pentagon Press Secretary Air Force Major General Pat Ryder is briefing the media. Let's take a look. Now, so I can't hear him read out uh, of that meeting. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, there is ongoing discussion through the higher military commission as it relates to 
the U.S. Uh, support for Iraq as it relates to the international coalition to defeat ISIS and what that relationship, what that longer term bilateral relationship will look like. Uh, so certainly not going to get ahead of that process, uh, but we'll have much more to read out following today's meeting. Uh, as it relates to U.S. forces and the response over the weekend, um, you know, as you know, uh, as a matter of operation security, uh, we're not going to be able to go into the specifics in terms of uh, the, the numbers of fighters involved at this time, uh, other than to say, again, U.S. fighters were involved in the response uh, and participated in, in taking down, uh, as I highlighted, over 80 uh, UAVs that were one-way attack UAVs that were en route to Israel. Thank you. Jennifer. General Ryder, were you given a heads up about the scope and scale of this attack? Uh, so I think what you're asking was, uh, did Iran give us a heads up? No, they did not. But were you given a heads up through allies? Um, we were not given specifics by Iran. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, any specifics in terms of exact times, dates. Um, you know, we obviously have a robust intelligence network uh, that provides uh, indications and warning. Uh, but to answer your specific question, no, Iran did not tell us when and where they were going to attack. And just in terms of the U is the U.S. concerned that U.S. forces in the region would be in jeopardy if Israel retaliates for Saturday night? And is that why the U.S. is not participating in a potential retaliation? Well, look, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals uh, at this point. Whether or not Israel responds to Iran's attack, of course, is something for Israel to, dis to discuss and to decide. Uh, as Secretary Austin has said, both publicly and privately, uh, we don't want to see escalation, but we obviously will take necessary measures to protect our forces in the region. And as was demonstrated over the weekend, we'll take necessary measures to defend Israel. Thank you. Um, I think officials had said uh, last week that additional asset, U.S. asset, military assets have been sent to the region. Are those assets still in place or have, now, have they been moved out now? Uh, as of right now, those assets are still in place. And then you've talked previously about Iran not seeking conflict with the United States. Is that still accurate? Do you today believe that Iran is not seeking conflict with the United States or Israel? Are you asking me if Iran is speaking? I, I'm not going to speak for Iran. I mean, certainly from the United States, we do not seek conflict with Iran. In conflict before, so today, is that statement still accurate? Yeah. I'm, again, I'm not going to speak for Iran. Thanks, Will. All right. That was Pentagon Press Secretary, Air Force Major General Pat Ryder, briefing the media there on two points. Um, talking at first about Iraq and the U.S.'s ongoing commitment to fighting ISIS in Iraq, uh, but saying that there would be more coming out after their meeting today on that. And he also uh, spoke on at length about Iran and Iran's attack on Israel, saying that U.S. fighters were engaged in the response to the attacks uh, on Israel on Saturday. He said that there was no heads up from Iran regarding specifics of these attacks, but the U.S. does have its own intelligence network. Um, which helped them to anticipate, potentially. And uh, he also said that uh, U.S. assets are still in place in that region. So NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao will bring us more on that topic on the Capitol Report at 5 p.m. Eastern, so stay tuned for that. Next up, record numbers of Chinese citizens keeping, keep entering the U.S. illegally. New data shows that more have entered this fiscal year so far than during all of 2023. The new numbers show that Border Patrol apprehended over 2,000 Chinese citizens in March. This brings the total since October to over 24,000. That's already more than the number for the entire fiscal year of 2023. In comparison, in 2021, less than 500 Chinese citizens entered the U.S. illegally. Are the voices of conservative students being silenced at American universities? A student group called the Young Americans for Freedom say it was derecognized at the University at Buffalo and barred from receiving the same benefits as other student groups. NTD's Daniel Monahan speaks with the nonprofit legal group Alliance Defending Freedom, which is representing them in a federal lawsuit.
Young Americans for Freedom has existed as a registered student organization on the University of Buffalo campus since 2017. The student group has had more than 100 members and has held weekly meetings on campus. As a chapter of Young America's foundation, the UB Young Americans for Freedom say their purpose is to provide an environment for the students of UB to learn about U.S. history, the U.S. Constitution, individual freedom, a strong national defense, free enterprise, and other topics. The group says the trouble began in March of 2023, when they hosted a conservative speaker on campus, Michael Knowles, to discuss gender identity issues. The appearance was met with a big protest. And about two weeks later, the University Student Association made a new rule that prohibited student groups from being chapters of national organizations. And the Americans for Freedom student group was later derecognized. Alliance Defending Freedom attorney Tyson Langhofer. So they were doing this to try to freeze out conservatives um, who want to bring you know, speakers to campus to talk about things from a conservative view, uh, viewpoint. And that's not allowed by the First Amendment. Langhofer says the Student Association canceled its policy and recognized Young Americans for Freedom after the lawsuit was filed, but it replaced the policy with another one that requires student organizations and their leaders to give up their legal rights in order for the clubs to be officially recognized. Langhofer says Young Americans for Freedom rightly refuses to sign a form waiving its legal rights. And so the Student Association has blocked the student group from accessing more than $6,000 in student fee funding in its account, using authority given to it by university officials. The government cannot condition certain rights that you have in, uh, by giving up other constitutional rights. And that's what's happening here. And it's not only unconstitutional, but it's frankly, you know, contrary to the purpose of a university, which is to promote, you know, this marketplace of ideas. Langhofer says people should be able to come together and hear different viewpoints and learn from them. So the best ideas rise to the top. But uh, instead, the, the university is picking winners and losers by, you know, uh, giving certain benefits to certain groups and taking away certain benefits from other groups based upon their viewpoint. The attorney says the marketplace of ideas has been mutated into an echo chamber. Langhofer says universities would do better by actually practicing what they preach. They say that they are a marketplace of ideas and they want to treat, they want students to learn how to live in a diverse, multicultural society, but that's not how they model it. ADF attorneys filed a motion in March with a federal court asking it to prohibit the University at Buffalo and its student association from continuing to block Young Americans for Freedom from accessing the more than $6,000 that belongs to it. Langhofer says it's important to understand that this isn't an isolated incident and that this type of censorship is going on throughout the country. The attorney says the U.S. has a strong First Amendment, but it's essential to stand up and fight for it. NTD reached out to the University of Buffalo for comment. We are still waiting to hear back from them. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A New Mexico judge sentenced movie armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed to 18 months in prison this afternoon for her involvement in the fatal shooting of a cinematographer on the set of the Western film Rust. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed in 2021 after lead actor and co-producer Alec Baldwin unknowingly pointed a loaded gun at her. Prosecutors blamed Gutierrez-Reed for unwittingly bringing live ammunition onto the set and failing to practice basic gun safety. The 26-year-old was convicted of involuntary manslaughter in March. Baldwin has pleaded not guilty to the same charge. When we come back, Tesla is planning a significant reduction in its workforce. What this could mean for the EV giant, that and more after the break. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Looking for a healthy and smooth tasting brew? Drop by Day's Coffee Roasters today and explore our wide selection of specialty grade small batch roasted coffee. 
home to North America's first enzyme fermented coffee. We source a wide selection of specialty grade coffee beans from around the world and our baristas are ready to craft your customized brew. Visit Day's Coffee at 28 North Street, Middletown, New York. Come experience a brew like no other. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain unmarked boxes. So your private matters, stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. It's a painting that is peaceful. There's a lot of beauty in it. And you forget about whatever you might be worried about. EV car manufacturer Tesla is planning to lay off 10% of its global workforce, according to a memo that CEO Elon Musk sent to employees. Tesla currently employs over 140,000 workers. The cuts would affect nearly 15,000 of those employees. The announcement comes as Tesla reported dismal first quarter sales this year with an 8.5% decrease compared to the first quarter of last year. The company's shares fell 3% Monday after the news broke. Tesla is facing an escalating price war from low-cost competitors such as Chinese EV maker BYD that has forced the company to cut costs and reduce profits. It's warning investors that growth this year may be significantly lower. And the financial markets, markets are reacting to Iran's weekend drone attack against Israel. NTD's Don Ma has the numbers in today's business brief. All right, thank you very much, Steph. Today we're talking about the market's reaction to what happened over the weekend with Iran attacking Israel. So on Friday, markets sold off sharply, but it seems like now investors are showing an element of relief with oil prices falling today and the market overall downplaying the risk of broader regional contagion. So Brent crude futures fell uh, today while uh, WTI futures also were down. Uh, oil benchmarks had risen previously uh, in anticipation of Iran's retaliatory attack, with prices touching their highest since October. Iran's attack involved more than 300 missiles and drones and was the first on Israel by another country in more than three decades, raising fears of a broader regional conflict affecting oil traffic through the Middle East. But Iran actually telegraphing a potential attack before it actually happened uh, was useful in lowering the temperature of geopolitical risk. Uh, gold, on the other hand, has been hitting record highs for weeks now, rising 0.3 percent. Uh, but the dollar and the ultra-safe government bonds that money managers often turn to when geopolitical tensions mount were all lower. That's all from me, Steph. Back to you. All right, thank you, Don. Next up, spring is finally here, and so are Boston's famous swan boats. This year marks the 147th season for the historical pedal boats. NTD's Fiona G brings us more on these cultural icons.
This weekend marked the beginning of the 2024 season for Boston's iconic swan boats. The mayor of Boston and eager visitors from across the country gathered in the Boston Public Garden to enjoy the spring weather, take a ride on the pedal boats, and appreciate a tangible piece of the city's history. Thank you for joining us for this beloved special tradition in Boston. The not just the, the swan boats and the history behind them, but the opportunity to be together as a family. Today, our, we brought our grandson, who has been reading about Make Way for Ducklings, and so we decided to bring him and see the ducklings and come ride the swan boat. The swan boats are propelled by a single operator in the back, who pedals a bicycle-like mechanism while passengers sit on benches in the front. Irish immigrant boat maker Robert Paget, who created the boats in 1877, designed the swans after being inspired by a Richard Wagner opera. The boats have been continuously operated by the Paget family on the same pond in Boston for 147 years. Fiona G, NTD News. Thank you for watching NTD Newsroom. I'm Stephanie Cox. See you tomorrow.